Even with these awful prices because of Ramageddon, it's still possible to put together a 1080p high level system without breaking the bank. My goal today is to show you exactly how to do that and not just with this video where we'll be going over all the parts and benchmarking, but I also have the full step-by-step -step assembly video and full benchmarking run linked down in the description. I also created a cheat sheet which has all the boring information but still important like cable management and the BIOS settings if you're trying to copy this. It's honestly one of the worst times to be building a gaming PC but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. And real quickly, my name is Zach and I'm just trying to help you jump into PC gaming or PC building no matter which way you wanna do it. My business is built to support you whether you wanna use free PC building resources on zttbuildhelp.com, copy build templates like this video, or if you just wanna buy a quick and easy pre-built, I got that covered too. I'm not trying to convince you to go down one path or another, I just wanna show you all of the options such as this $650 build. All right, starting with the CPU, here we're immediately making an adjustment because of RAM pricing. Just a few months ago, I would have recommended going with a Ryzen 5 5600, but because we know we're gonna spend more on RAM and even the SSD with the current market, we gotta save some money somehow, and this is one place to do it. Now, don't get me wrong, this 5500 is still a very solid six core and 12 threaded chip. It's just not as good as the 5600, but it'll still work great with the GPU that we selected, more on that later. Now, yes, I would have preferred to go with an AM5 based system, and if you have the extra money to spend, I would definitely recommend you do that. With $650, that's just next to impossible though because the more expensive CPU, motherboard, and those ridiculous RAM prices will eat up too much of your budget. You'd end up with a very, very cheap GPU and we obviously don't wanna do that. AM4 is the better play for right now. With that being said, the motherboard is the ASRock B550M Pro 4 and I grabbed this new on Newegg for $80. There's been a couple of pretty solid micro ATX B550 boards over there lately, so I'll have linked in the cheat sheet some alternative models that I recommend as well. And real quickly, what's also down in the description is today's video sponsor, Fantech, and specifically their new S2 Pro electric screwdriver. I'm somehow almost losing money on this sponsorship. Fantech sent one of these over for us to check out, and now all of my PC builders want me to buy one. One of my employees seriously came into my office asking if we could buy one of these for every PC building station here at the office. It's that good. With this bigger design, it's rocking a 250 RPM high magnetic motor that delivers enough torque for for anything you need while PC building. The torque is actually adjustable too with seven different settings and this case that it comes with has 20 of the most common bits you'll need, an extension rod, and even a 90 degree angle adapter which is one of the reasons why our PC builders love it. The battery life is fantastic and it even comes with a flashlight so you can see what you're doing. Big thanks to Fantex for sending one of these out but I probably should have asked for more than one. I'd also recommend their B10 Pro Max Electric Air Duster. These are powerhouse dusters that some of our PCs around here really need. The links to pick either one of these up for yourself are down in the description. All right, getting back to our parts list, now we gotta tackle the RAM, and I'm not gonna lie, you might be questioning this one. This is the ThickWatt RGB 32 gigabyte DDR4 kit, and it's actually clocked at 3600 megahertz with a decent CL rating of 18. There's a good chance this is your first time hearing about ThickWatt, they're not that popular, but they've actually been around for a bit now, and everything that I've tried just works. This was sitting brand new on their eBay store for only $86, but chances are that it's even higher at the time you're watching this video. But this is where you might want to get a little crafty during Ramageddon. Unfortunately, the days of just going down and clicking the affiliate link in the description and having everything you need readily available in stock, we're just not there anymore. You'll have to search on PC Part Picker for any 2x16 gigabyte DDR4 kit, preferably at 3200 megahertz or higher and a CL rating of 18 or lower. If you have to stretch a little outside of that, it's okay, just not ideal. The other thing you could do is just go down to 16 gigabytes and in a $650 build, that's really not that big of a deal. That's exactly what I did in our recent video, which was a $600 small form factor gaming PC. I just didn't want to do the same thing in this video, so I'm trying out a not so popular brand instead. Most RAM sticks these days are actually made from the same like two or three manufacturers. There's just a bunch of different brands that put their own heat spreaders on there, and those are the brands that we buy from and know about. All right, let's move on though, because I've been talking about RAM extensively pretty much every single day here at the ZTT HQ for the past month. So next up is the SSD, and yeah, those prices are also rising, but just not as quickly, at least for 
Now, this is a crucial one terabyte P3 Plus NVMe, and I haven't used this one in a really long time. For the past one to two years, Gen 4, no matter what, has usually been the play because it's the same price as Gen 3. Right now, with the higher prices, there is actually sometimes a gap depending on when and where you look. For the $62 that I paid, I thought this was the best deal at the time. You absolutely can go with pretty much any Gen 3 or Gen 4 NVMe drive that you find a good deal on. If you want to compare a few different models, then head on over to my totally free zttbuildhelp.com. Click on the SSD list, and that will show you all the specs, speeds, and ratings that you need. Oh, and real quickly, while we're on the website, I actually just uploaded my NVIDIA gaming PC build guide templates, as well as the YouTube cheat sheet page. If you're looking for other build guides to follow at different price ranges, that's exactly where I'd start. Next up, we have the power supply, and this is the Raid Max Cobra 650 watt unit. I know, you probably also haven't heard of this one either, but it's kind of a hidden gem. If you use the PSU tier list, which remember, is made by the actual PSU experts way smarter than me, they gave this a decent tier C rating. Tier C is nothing to write home about, and I wouldn't pair this with a high-end GPU or anything, but for a $650 gaming PC, it's absolutely perfect if you find it on a good deal. I sniped these for $35, which is an outrageous price, and that's not the first time this deal has popped up. Every time it does, I usually grab like 10 or 15 of them at a time, and that just recently happened, so expect to see these on the next budget build guide videos over the next few months. I'm gonna try my best not to mention how they misspelled PCIe on the front of the box every time. We'll see how I do. If you don't see this deal, then there are definitely some alternatives, probably not at $35, but again, that's in the cheat sheet. What's also in there are case alternatives, and you might need them because I'm not gonna lie, I'm not a huge fan of this one. It's the brand new Fantex XT M3, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think a lot of YouTubers were pretty excited about it. On paper, it's really impressive being only $60 and coming with three pre-installed ARGB fans. The design itself also looks good at first, and it's on the smaller side of micro ATX cases. I'm kind of surprised at how much people were praising it though, because once I started building with it, I found a couple of flaws. I don't mean to nitpick, but I'm really not digging the way these front fans are aligned. The mini Venn diagram with them slightly overlapping looks kind of weird in my opinion. They're also not perfectly centered vertically, but way more important than that was my disappointment during the cable management process. When you're using cable extensions especially, the case doesn't help you out a whole lot, which is a real bummer. There's this metal plate right below the PSU, which I guess is where you're supposed to hide the bulk of cables, but that area wasn't big enough, which is why I had to route the 24 pin all the way out and around. There's also very minimal spots for zip tie downs and things like that. It just doesn't help you that much. So I definitely recommend a modular power supply with a case like this. Without one, you wouldn't have a fun time at all. Oh, and for a quick tip, make sure you feed every cable through this little hole before plugging them in. Otherwise that back panel isn't gonna close. And yeah, while we're talking about those cables, these are in fact 16 gauge cable extensions from Asia Horse. If you're copying this at home, you don't have to use them. It's purely an aesthetic choice. And honestly, because of what I just said, it's a small additional headache. If you're comfortable buying a tier C power supply, I consider the white Apivia Prestige 600 watt if it's in stock. I've used the Prestige for many years with these budget builds, and now they have a white version. Personally, I'd much rather use that than the combo that I went with. To continue these white aesthetics, I went with the Thermalrite Assassin X 120 SE ARGB to keep the 5500 cool. It's not difficult to keep those temperatures in check, so feel free to go with whatever you want. I was originally just gonna spray paint the stock Ryzen cooler, which I've done for so many builds already, but I ran out of time, so I just bought this one instead for less than 20 bucks. And finally, to wrap up this parts list, we of course have the GPU, and if you haven't figured it out already, that's a Zotac RTX 3060 Ti amp card that I picked up for only 215 bucks used over on Jawa. With the RAM prices the way they are, I think now is a great time to explore buying a used graphics card if you weren't already going to, that way you can maintain a still high level of price to performance value. Eight gigabytes of VRAM isn't 100% ideal, but with this low of a budget build, and since we'll only be playing in 1080p, I think it's perfectly fine, at least for now. If you're considering checking out used cards, I'd honestly go to Jawa first. Personally, I like to look at the official Jawa store account and see what they're selling. They usually price the GPUs a few dollars under whatever the average on eBay is going for at that current moment, so you know you're getting a good deal. Before we confirm that though with the benchmarks, let's take a quick look at the parts list, and as you can see, I stayed right around the $650 mark. It would have been a bit under that if I would have actually painted that CPU cooler like I just said, but even with using this $19 thermal rate, we're very close to the target mark. But now, let's jump into the benchmarks, and the first one we have here is Battlefield 6, and in 1080p medium settings, this PC cranked out a pretty impressive 110 average FPS. Most games we test today are gonna flirt between high and medium settings. For a shooter like this one, I'm personally gonna favor a little bit worse graphics for higher FPS, but a game like this still looks really good. Next up, here's Fortnite, and here we put the settings just at our standard 1080p Pro, and this got 151 FPS. For Arc Raiders, which I personally haven't tried yet, this one looks really good because in 1080p with high settings, it got 
117 FPS. Baldur's Gate 3 in 1080p high got 75 FPS, and even Borderlands 4 got 80 FPS in 1080p high, but we did have to enable a little bit of frame gen for that one. Here are the rest of the games that we tested, and as you can see, almost everything is around the 1080p medium or high mark, and that's honestly very impressive considering we're using a $215 used GPU. Also, don't forget about the thick watt RAM. Our PCs are just not gonna have the same parts that they did even just two months ago. During Ramageddon, though, it still is possible to get a high level FPS per dollar value. I wouldn't recommend comparing builds like this to other build guides from earlier this year because the market is just not available anymore. In fact, if you are looking at other build guides, just consider them about $100 more. A $450 build guide is now $550 and so on. That'll give you a little bit more accurate representation of what we're working with during Ramageddon. And just so we can check out the cooling real quickly, here's Monster Hunter Wilds, which we got right on the money at 60 FPS and 1080p high settings with some DLSS sprinkled on there. Here you can see that the CPU is getting up there to 70 to 80% utilization, but it's still staying very nice and chilly around 60 degrees. The GPU here is of course up to 100%, which is what we wanna see, and that temperature is in the low 60s. Overall, I'm actually happy with how this build turned out. I'm just not a huge fan of the case. If you wanna see a completely different way to put together a build like this around the same price point, then the video for that is up on the screen right now.